one of chapter number three of the Phenomenology of Mind, volume one, by George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter number three, The Force and Understanding, The World of Appearance and the Supersensible World, part one. Translator's Note The term force holds primarily with reference to the realm of nature, whether physical or vital, but it is also used more or less analogically in reference to other spheres, e.g. morality. It is the objective counterpart of the activity of understanding. It is objectively the same kind of relation of unity to difference which is subjectively realised when the mind understands. Force is a self-conditioned principle of unity. The differences are the expressions of force, the unity involved in the differences out of itself. Understanding similarity is a self-conditioned process. It understands in reducing differences to some ultimate unity, which is capable of deriving or explaining those differences from itself. The unconditioned universal, to which we are led to by the analysis of perception, takes shape, therefore as a force. The question is, how are the elements of this unconditioned universal related, and how do they hold together? The answer is found in the highest achievement of the operation of understanding, the establishment of a kingdom of laws, which in its entirety is the meaning of the world in so far as understanding goes. But laws per se are looked on as an inner realm, which merely appears in the detailed particulars which these laws control, and in which those laws are made manifest. The differences, in fact, are phenomena. The laws per se the laws per se are behind the scenes. The world as a whole thus becomes distinguished into a realm of phenomena and a realm of noumena. These two realms set a new problem to the mind and must again be brought together in a completer way than understanding can do. This new state of consciousness is self-consciousness. In this section we have at once an analysis of empiricism and a criticism of the Kantian solution of the problem of empiricism. It is shown that if phenomena are appearances of noumena, then the noumena do appear, and are, in fact, nothing except so far as they appear. Otherwise, the noumena, so far from being hidden, are worse than appearances, they are illusion. The phenomena are not merely appearances to the mind, but appearances of something that does make itself manifest. If phenomena are thus not external to, and still less independent of noumena, noumena are just as truly imminent in phenomena. Treated in any other way, noumena can at best only be another kind of phenomena, and this raises anew precisely the problem which the opposition of phenomena or noumena was intended to solve. Phenomena are related to noumena as the tree is to the wood, not as compound is to its atoms. The solution of the difficulty is thus only to be found in the type of consciousness which contains both, and this, Hegel says, is self-consciousness. End of translator's note. Consciousness has found seeing and hearing, etc., pass away into the dialectic process of sense experience, and has, at the stage of perception, arrived at thoughts which, however, it brings together in the first instance in the unconditional universal. This unconditioned element, again, if it were taken as an inert essence, bare and simple, would itself be nothing else than the one-sided extreme of self in existence. For the non-essential would then stand over and against it, but if thus related to the latter, it would be itself unessential, and consciousness would not have got disentangled from the deceptions of perception. Whereas this universal has proved to be one which has passed out of such conditioned separate existence and returned into itself. The unconditioned universal, which henceforward is the true object of consciousness, is still object of consciousness. Consciousness has not yet grasped its principle or notion, qua notion. There is an essential distinction between the two which must be drawn. On the one hand, consciousness is aware that the object has passed from its relation to another back onto itself, and thereby become inherently and implicitly an sich notion, but, on the other hand, consciousness is not yet the notion explicitly or for itself, and consequently it does not know itself in that reflected object. We, 
who are analysing experience, found this object arise through the process of consciousness in such a way that consciousness is implicated and involved in the development of the object, and the reflection is the same on both sides, i.e. there is only one reflection. But because in this movement consciousness had as its content merely the objective entity, and not consciousness as such, the result has to be given an objective significance for consciousness. Consciousness, however, still withdrawing from what has arisen, so that the latter, in objective form, is the essential reality to consciousness. Understanding has, indeed, eo ipso, done away with its own untruth and the untruth in its object. What has thereby come into view is the notion of the truth as implicit inherent truth, which is not yet notion or lacks a consciously explicit existence for itself, and is something which understanding allows to have its way without knowing itself in it. It works out its own reality for itself, so that consciousness has no share in its process of free realization, but merely looks on and apprehends that realization as a naked fact. It is consequently our business in the first instance to step into its place and be the notion which works up into shape what is contained in the result. With this complete formation of the object which is presented to consciousness as a bare extant fact, mere consciousness awareness becomes for the first time conceptual consciousness, conscious comprehension. The result arrived at was an unconditional universal, in the first instance in the negative and abstract sense that consciousness negated its one-sided notions and abstracted them, it surrendered them. This result, however, has inherently a positive significance. It has established the unity of existence for self and existence for another. In other words, absolute opposites are immediately posited as one and the same reality. First this seems to affect merely the formal relation of the moments to one another. But to be for self and to be for another constitutes the content itself as well, because the opposition, looked at truly, can have no other nature than what it has come about in the result, viz. that the content taken in perception for truth belongs in point of fact solely to the form and is dissipated into its unity. The content is at the same time universal. There can be no other content by which its peculiar constitution would refuse to return into this unconditioned universality. Such content would be some specific way or other of being for itself and taking up a relation to something else. To be in general for self and to stand in relation to something else constitutes the very nature and meaning of that whose truth lies in being unconditionally universal, and the result is through and through universal. Since, however, this unconditioned universal is an object for consciousness, the distinction of form and content make it appear within it, and, in the shape of content, the moments have the aspect in which they were first presented, that of being on one side a universal medium of many substantial elements, and, on the other, a unit reflected into self, where their substantial independence is overthrown and done away with. The former dissolves in the independence of the thing, is the condition of passivity which consists in it being something for something else. The latter is its individual substance, its being something on its own account, for sich. We have to see what shape these moments take in the unconditioned universal which is their essential nature. It is obvious at the outset that by existing only in this universal they do not in general lie any longer apart from one another, but rather are in themselves essentially self-cancelling aspects and what is established is only their transition into one another. One moment, then, appears as a universal medium, or as the subsistence of independent constituents, as the reality that stepped aside. The independence of these constituent elements, however, is nothing else than this medium, i.e. this universal is simply and entirely the plurality of such diverse universals. That the universal is per se undivided unity, with this plurality means, however, that these elements are each where the other is. They mutually permeate one another, without touching one another, because conversely the manifold diversity is equally independent. Along with that too goes the fact that they are absolutely pervious and porous, and are cancelled and superseded. To be thus superseded, again, or the reduction of this diversity to bare and simple self-existence, is nothing else than the medium itself, and this is the independence of the different elements. In other words, the elements set up as independent pass directly over into their unity, and their unity directly into its explicit diversity, and the latter back once again into the reduction into unity. This process is what is called force. 
one of its moments where force takes the form of a dispersion of the independent elements each with a being of its own is the expression of force when however force takes the form of that wherein they disappear and vanish it is force proper force withdrawn from expressing itself and driven back into itself but in the first place force driven back into itself must express itself and secondly in that expression it is still force existing within itself as much as in thus being within itself is its expression when we thus keep both moments in this immediate unity it is understanding to which the conception of force belongs that is properly speaking the principle which carries the different moments qua different for per se they should not be different the distinction consequently exists only in thought stated otherwise only the mere conception of force has been put forward in the above not its realization in point of fact however force is the unconditioned universal which is in itself just what it is for something else or which holds in its difference within itself for it is nothing else than existence for another hence for force to be what it truly is it has to be completely set free from thought and has to be put forward as a substantial reality of these differences that is first the substance qua the entire force remaining essentially self-contained an und für sich and then its difference as substantial entities or as moments subsisting each in its own account force as such force as driven back within itself is in this way by itself an excluding unit for which the unfolding of the elements or differences is another thing subsisting separately and thus there are set up two sides distinct and independent but force is also the whole or it remains what in its very conception it is that is to say these differences remain mere forms superficial vanishing moments the differences between force proper withdrawn into itself and force unfolded and expressed in independent constituent elements would at the same time have no being at all if they had no subsistence i e force would have no being if it did not really exist in those opposite ways but to exist in this way as opposite aspects means nothing else than that both moments are themselves at the same time independent it is this process we now have to deal with the process by which both moments get themselves fixed as independent and then cancel their independence again looked at broadly it is manifest that this process is nothing else than the process of perceiving where the aspects both percipient and content perceived are at once inseparably united as regards the process of grasping the truth and yet by that very fact each aspect is at the same time reflected into itself is something on its own account in the present case these two aspects are elements or moments of force they subsist with one unity just as much as this unity which appears as the middle term for the distinct and independent extremes always gets broken into the very extremes which only becomes such through this taking place thus the process which formerly took the shape of the self-negation of contrary conceptions here assumes objective form and is a movement of force the result of which is to bring out the unconditioned universal as something which is not objective which is the inner unperceived being of things force is thus determined since it is taken as force or as reflected into itself is the one side of its notion and meaning but a substantial extreme and moreover the extreme established with the characteristics of oneness in virtue of this the subsistence of the elements which have arisen falls outside it and is something other than it since of necessity it has to be this subsistence i e to express externalize itself its expression takes the form that the other approaches it and incites it but in point of fact since it must necessarily express itself it has within itself this other which to begin with took up a position as something outside it the latter this other must be retracted in order that the force should be established as a single one and its essential nature which consists in its self-expression put forward as another approaching it externally force itself is rather this universal medium for the subsistence of the moments as constituted elements or in other words it has expressed or externalized itself and what was to be something outside it is attracting or inciting it is really force itself it exists now as the medium of the constituent elements which have been evolved but at the same time it is in its very nature one and single 
and has essentially the form of being that in which the various elements are superseded this oneness is in consequence now something other than external to force since force takes its place as the medium for the elements to exist in and force therefore has this essential being outside itself since however it must of necessity be the essential nature which as yet is not affirmed to be this other comes forward soliciting or inciting it to reflect into itself to turn this pseudo external factor into an aspect of itself in other words this other cancels its external expression in point of fact however it is force itself that is reflected into itself that is the sublation of the external expression the oneness vanishes as it appears viz as something external force is that very other is force thrust back onto itself what took the character of an external other and incited force at once into expression and to return into itself turns out directly to be itself force for the other shows itself to be universal medium as well as one end single and shows this in such a way as each of the forces assumes appears at the same time to be merely a vanishing moment consequently force in that there is another for it and it is for another has a whole not yet developed its complete being there are two forces present at the same time the notion of both is no doubt the same notion but it has passed out of its unity into duality instead of the opposition continuing to be entirely and essentially a mere moment it appears to have escaped from the control of the unity and to have become owing to this diremption two quite independent forces we now have to see more precisely what sort of situation this independence introduces to begin with the second force stands towards the force incited in the character of inciting force and moreover with respect to its content plays the part of universal medium but since that second force consists essentially in an alternation of these two moments and is itself force it is likewise in point of fact the universal medium only then when it is incited or solicited to being so and in this same way too it is a negative unity or incites and leads to the retraction of force only by being incited thereto as a result this distinction which took place between one force regarded as inciting and the other as incited turns also into one and the same reciprocal interchange of characteristics the interplay of these two forces in this way arises from and consists in the two being thus determined with the opposite characteristics in their being for one another in virtue of this determination and in the complete and direct exchange of their characteristics a transition from one to the other whereby alone these determinations in which the forces seem to have appeared independently have being for example the inciting force set up as a universal medium and on the other hand the force incited as a force repressed but the former is universal medium just by the very fact of the latter being repressed that is to say this latter is really what incites the former and makes the medium it claims to be the former gets the character it has only through the other and is inciting force only in so far as it is incited by the latter to do so and loses just as readily this character given to it for this character passes or rather has already passed into the character of the other the former acting as an external way takes the part of the universal medium but only by its having been incited by the other forces to do so this means however that the latter gives it that position and is really itself essentially universal medium it gives the inciting agency this character just because this other character is essentially its own i e because it really is its own self to complete our insight into this principle of the process we may notice further that the distinctions themselves reveal distinctions in a twofold manner they are on the one hand distinctions of content since one extreme is force reflected into itself while the other is a medium for the constituent elements involved on the other hand they appear as distinctions of form since one incites and the other is incited the former being active and the latter passive as regards the distinction of content they are in a general way distinct or distinct for us who are analyzing the process as regards the form however they are independent in their relation they break away from one another of themselves and stand opposed in the perception of the movement of force consciousness becomes aware that the extremes in both of these aspects are nothing per se that rather these sides in which their distinction of nature was meant to consist are merely vanishing moments 
an immediate transition of each into its opposite. For us, however, who are analysing the process, it was also true that, as stated above, per se, the distinctions qua distinctions of content and form vanished, and on the side of form the active inciting or independent factor was, in its very nature, the same as what, from the other side of content, was presented as a repressed force, force driven back into itself. The passive incited or related factor was, from the side of form, the same as what, from the side of content, took shape as universal medium for the many constituent elements. From this we see that the notion of force becomes actual when it is resolved into two forces, and when we see, too, how it comes to be so. These two forces exist as independent entities, but their existence lies in a movement towards each other of such a kind that in order to be, each has to, in reality, get into its position purely through the other, that is to say, their being purely the significance of disappearance. They are not like extremes that keep themselves something positively fixed and merely transmit an external property to one another through their common medium and by external contact. They are what they are solely in this medium and in their contact with each other. We have there immediately both force as it is independently, force repressed within itself, and also in its expression force inciting and force being incited. These moments are thus not divided and set up as two extremes, offering each other only as an opposite pole, rather their true nature is simply and solely to be each other through the other, and to be in the first instance no more than just what each is thus through the other, since it is just that. They have thus, in point of fact, no substances of their own which could support and maintain them. The notion of force rather maintains itself as the essence in its very actuality. Force when actual exists wholly and only in its expression, and this at the same time is nothing else than a process of cancelling itself. This actual force when represented as detached from its expression and existing by itself is force driven back into itself, but this feature is itself, in point of fact, as appears from the foregoing, merely a moment in the expression of force. The true nature of force thus remains merely the thought or idea of force. The moments in its realisation, its substantial independence and its process rush, without let or hindrance, together into one single undivided unity, a unity which is not force withdrawn into itself, for this is merely one of those moments, but is the notion qua notion. The realisation of force, then, is at the same time dissipation or loss of reality, it thereby becomes something quite different, viz. this universality which understanding knows from the start or immediately to be its essential nature, and which shows itself too to be the essence of it in what is supposed to be its reality in the actual substance. So far as we look on the first universal notion of understanding, where force does not yet exist for itself, the second is now its essential reality, as it is revealed in and for itself. Or conversely, if we look on the first universal as the immediate, which should be an actual object for consciousness, then this second has the characteristic of being the negative of sensually objective force. It is force in the form in which it is true being. Its force exists merely as an object for understanding. The first would be force withdrawn into itself, i.e. force as substance. The second, however, is the inner being of things qua inner, which is one and the same with the notion qua notion. This true being of things here has the characteristic that it does not exist immediately for consciousness. Rather, consciousness takes up mediated relation to the inner. In the form of understanding, it looks through the intervening play of forces into the real and true background of things. The middle term, combining the two extremes, understanding and the inner of things, is the explicitly evolved being of force, which is now and henceforth a vanishing process for understanding itself. Hence it is called appearance, for being, which is per se straight away not being. We call a show a semblance. It is, however, merely not a show, but the appearance, a totality of seeming. This totality as totality or universal is what makes up the inner world, the play of forces in the sense of its reflections into itself. There consciousness has before itself, in objective form, the things of perception as they truly are, i.e. as moments turning without halt or separate subsistence directly into the opposite, the one changing immediately into the universal, the essential becoming at once something inessential, and vice versa. This play of forces is consequently the development of the negative, 
but its true nature is the positive element viz the universal the implicit object the object existing per se the being of this object for consciousness is mediated through the movement of appearance by which the constituent of perception and the sensuous objective world as a whole get merely negative significance. Their consciousness is turned back upon itself as the truth, but being consciousness, it again makes the truth into an inner being of the object and distinguishes this reflection of things from its own reflection into self, just as the mediating process likewise is for it still an objective process. This inner nature is therefore for it an extreme placed over and against it, but it is on that account the truth for it, because therein, as in something essential, real it possesses at the same time the certainty of its own self the moment of its own self-existence but it is not yet conscious of this basis its self-existence for the independence its being on its own account which should have the inner world within it would nothing else than be the negative process this negative process is however for consciousness still objective vanishing appearance and not yet its own proper self-existence hence the inner is no doubt to be taken as notion but consciousness does not yet know the nature of the notion. Within this inner truth, the absolute universal, which has got rid of the opposition between universal and particular, and become the object of understanding, is a supersensible world, in which henceforth opens up the true world, lying beyond the sensuous world, which is the world of appearance. Away, remote from the vanishing present, lies the permanent beyond, an imminent inherent reality, which is the first and therefore imperfect manifestation of reason, i.e. it is merely the pure element where the truth finds its abode and its essential being. End of chapter 3, part 1, recording by Morris in Alsey, Bedfordshire.